Let's join together in singing for everyone born. Pastor Peter Samuelson. I'm the Redeemer Bridge Pastor. And welcome to worship today. Welcome all members and visitors to the fifth Sunday after Easter. We want to thank the Ronald Klipstein family for the beautiful flowers. Ronald's funeral was yesterday and we mourn his passing and we remember the family in our prayers. And please join now for the Thanksgiving for baptism. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you made us new, leading us from life to death, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our soul, 
like cups of cool water shared with us strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us in life. To be given, to you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's first reading comes from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm 22, verses 25 through 31. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow down before God. For, dom for dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. Today's second reading comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent God's only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in God and God in us, because God has given us God's Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent God's Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. 
God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters or neighbors, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their siblings also. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in the gospel acclamation when I think of the goodness of Jesus. Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and in my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. When I was a pastor in Atlanta in the early 2000s, I had to learn a whole new vocabulary. They use words a little differently down there than they do in the upper Midwest. One of the best words that they use, and one I still miss to this day, is the plural of you, y'all. Up here, we just have you. If I'm talking to a single person, it's you. If I'm talking to a group of you, it's you. And when down south, I'm talking to a single person, it's you. And when I'm talking to more than one or a group, it's y'all. It's very useful. In fact, I'll come back to that word a bit later. The other word I miss is might could, as when somebody asks you to do something and you say, I might could do that. It's a very useful word as well. It's kind of a nice way of saying, I'm about 50-50 on the proposal. I'm surprised we haven't co-opted this up here in Minnesota nice country for it's a way of saying yes to something without really committing to it, a kind of hedging your bets linguistically. I might could do that. But the one word that it took a little getting used to was the word stay. It's used a little differently down south. Someone might ask you, where do you stay? And what they mean is, where do you live? Or they might say, oh, I stay down in Decatur, a little city outside of Atlanta, meaning I live in Decatur. I find myself using it more and more along with y'all and Mike could. You know what they say, when in Rome, in today's gospel, we have this strange word, abide. It's an old-fashioned word, not much in use anymore. We wouldn't say, for instance, I think I'll just abide here a while, y'all go on without me. We might use the word stay or remain or hang out, which in fact would be all good translations of abide. 
I'll just stay here. Or I'll just hang out here. The best translation, though, might be the southern meaning of the word stay. For abide can mean live or dwell or make a home with, all these things. For example, when Jesus, just in the chapter before, said, those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. That word home in this verse is the noun form of the verb abide. Or to use old fashioned language, an abode is a place where you abide. Or to use our Southern version, Jesus will make a home with us and will stay with us. Stay, abide, remain, dwell. This is what Jesus promises us, to stay with us no matter what. He abides in us, he stays in us, just as we abide in him and we stay in him. So I have a new answer for anyone from the South who asks me where I stay. I'm going to say, I stay in Jesus. That reminds me of that hymn. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it's staying on Jesus. I looked at the uh, words up in the internet, the way Mavis Staples sings it is that she not only waking up with her mind staying on Jesus, but she's singing and praying and walking and talking, all the while, her whole day, her mind is staying on Jesus. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, abide in me. In this gospel, Jesus gives us an image, a metaphor to capture this life in Christ, what it means to abide, to stay in Jesus. It's the beloved image of the vine and the branches. Jesus said, Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. What I like about this image is the necessity and the inevitability of the connection between us and Jesus. Just like a branch cannot live without a vine, so can we not live without Jesus. Just like a branch has no choice in staying connected to a vine, so we also have no choice about staying connected to Jesus. We just are. No choice involved. We are the branches. We are connected to Jesus. We can as much disconnect ourselves from Jesus as a branch can disconnect itself from a vine. We're stuck. We must stay, we remain, we abide. And Jesus seems to mix his metaphors a little when he says, whoever does not abide in me will be thrown away like a branch and withers, making it sound like we might have a choice in the matter, like we might choose not to stay in Jesus or remain in him. We might choose to tear ourselves off the vine, but we know that's impossible. We can only be cut off from the vine if the vine grower, whom Jesus identifies as God, the Father, cuts the branch from the vine. Only God can cut us loose from the vine. While that might strike a, a little fear in us, Jesus is really making us face the question, would God do that? Is this the God we know, the God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? The God who raises Jesus from the dead after what we did to him? The God of infinite chances to return to God when we might turn away? Jesus wants us to think about this. Who is God and what is God's nature? Who is the vine grower and what is in the vine grower's heart? And as you think about this, remember what Paul said, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What the vine grower cares about is that we have life and have it abundantly, all of us. So this vine grower is clearly interested in the vine bearing fruit, abundant life for all. God cares about things like justice and equity fair economic distribution that all should be housed and fed. 
that we should love and treat our neighbor as we love and treat ourselves, even collectively, through the police we hire to keep us safe, through the corporate expression of ourselves as city or state or nation. God cares about these things. God wants us to bear the fruit of justice, equity, compassion, and care for our neighbor. There is a clue in this text about how this might be done. The clue brings me back to my Southernisms that I learned 15 years ago in Atlanta. The you in this text is plural. Jesus is not speaking to you as an individual. Jesus is speaking to you, to us, as a collective. So listen to the Southern translation. Abide in me as I abide in y'all. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you all unless you all abide in me. I am the vine, y'all are the branches. And I might have even included an all y'all for emphasis. In Western Christianity, we are biased to think that Jesus is talking to us as individuals. Or if we hear Jesus say you all, we think of ourselves as a collection of individuals, each on our own. But when Jesus here is using the plural you, you all, I think Jesus is talking to the church, all of us collectively. Jesus is the vine, the church is the branches. And just like the vine cannot, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can the church unless the church abides in Jesus. However we hear these words, whether collectively or as individuals, life comes to us through our connection to Jesus. And if collectively or as individuals, what that life will look like, what that kind of fruit we expect to bear, we just need to look to our source of life, where the life-giving sap comes from, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And when we look at the totality of Jesus, his life and death and resurrection, what kind of fruit did he bear? Well, he bore the fruit of forgiveness in his death on the cross. He bore the fruit of inclusion in his ministry to the outcast. He bore the fruit of healing in his encounter with the mentally and physically ill. He bore the fruit of justice in his encounters with injustice. Forgiveness, inclusion, healing, and justice these are just some of the fruits we are destined to bear as a church and as individuals connected to Jesus. So let's start with forgiveness. How are we doing as a church, a congregation? My mother was a great teacher of forgiveness, both in word and action. She would often quote from the end of Luther's explanation to the Eighth Commandment. And she said, you, you should defend your neighbor, speak well of them, and explain their actions in the kindest way. They became for me words to live by. How are we doing with inclusion? Are we as welcoming as we want to be or say we are? With word, with God, there is a continual chance for examination and realistic assessment and a renewed effort to be what we confess we are, followers of Christ. We are forgiven when we fall short and motivated to hear, to bear fruit worthy of our source of life, the vine we are connected to, Jesus Christ. We've had more than enough chances to do the healing ministry in this time of COVID. And each of you is doing some aspect of healing ministry just in your reaching out to one another or just in getting vaccinated, just in helping others in their day to day. Never has there been a better chance to be healers as Jesus was. And justice, with a heart for the outcast and the oppressed, this is a fruit we can especially bear these days where there is so much injustice that has been exposed. Here it is most useful to think about how we act collectively, how we advocate for justice in our collective expression as a church, as a city, as a state and a nation. The advocacy and evangelism leaders in our congregation have teamed together for some opportunities to advocate for just laws and policing and housing and health equity. We do this work because we are connected to the vine who said, I came that you, you all, all of us 
have life and have it abundantly. It's our connection to Jesus that gives us life, abundant life. It's our connection to Jesus that motivates us to work for this abundant life for all people, that all should be clothed and fed, that all should have housing and the dignity of work at a living wage. And when the pandemic has caused us separation and anxiety, when we have lost so much and feel disconnected from ourselves and from each other, these words of Jesus, that he is irrevocably connected to us as a branch is connected to the vine, and we are irrevocably connected to each other through Jesus. These words come as pure grace and remind us that we are siblings in Christ. So go forth and be who you are. Bear the fruit that is in you in your baptism, where you were joined to Jesus forever. Alleluia. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in singing, Behold What Manner of Love. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the Spirit of God. That we should be called the children. Almighty and merciful Lord grants us pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all our sins. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray. God of love, you called us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, amen. Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church, and your church abides in you. May this beloved community reflect the love you have for all people. Help your church bear fruit and witness to your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth, 
As we wonder at the beauty of creation, may we seek vital connections among all that depends on earth for life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that may, they may lead not by fear but with love for those they are called to serve. Motivate us to bear the fruit of advocacy, so our legislators hear your word of justice through us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially those in our congregation in need of your help. And we pray today for the family of Roland Klipstein at his death. Be with them in their mourning. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your spirit. We are connected with them by faith. With them may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, all are invited to gather elements, bread or, and wine or grape juice, to partake in this sacrament. For those who are without the elements, know that you are joined in Christ in this meal. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Please join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts, satisfy the hunger still around us, and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's join together until we meet again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia.
Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.